thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm from the group of uh, applied physics in the uh, University of Geneva, from Hugo's Binden group. Um, so this talk is going to be a, a slightly different tone, uh, in the sense that, as it, as it says in the title, it's a bit of uh, proof of principle uh, results that I'll show you, and then a kind of um, uh, a, a roadmap. I'll also show you how we've taken such an experiment from proof of principle to a more practical high-speed implementation. Um, and indeed, uh, the reason for this um, uh, investigation is kind of uh, spurred on by the fact that there's been a lot of um, uh, work in the community on quantum hacking of QKD systems. So we know that we can encode uh, information into our beautiful single photons, send them through fibers, and create secret keys. And uh, we now now we now have very uh, quite robust uh, um, and fast systems, which are not really looking like uh, they're stuck in the lab somewhere. We can, it really looks like we can put them in the real world. However, we also need to be vigilant that um, we have quantum hackers around, and Vadim is by, uh, by far the most famous one. And uh, um, you know, we need to we need to be uh, aware of this. And indeed, if you look at some um, review papers on QKD, and now uh, ever since this kind of revolution of uh, starting to test QKD systems, which is uh, of paramount importance because if if, uh, if you look at any cryptographic prim primitives, we want to make sure that there's always good guys and the bad guys because the bad guys do actually help to check that our system is secure. Um, so if you catalog all these kinds of attacks um, that have been demonstrated so far, uh, we'll see that actually a lot of them are aimed at the detection devices uh, in the QKD systems. So. Um, this is kind of like, uh, by many people, is quoted as the Achilles heel of the quantum key distribution system. And, of course, I'm not saying that uh, we can't uh, counter any of these uh, attacks, and it's possible. Um, but some people have started to um, think about, in a more fundamental way, what can we do to really prevent such uh, attacks uh, completely so that, you know, there really is no way of doing it at all. So in fact, um, one thing that has been mentioned already this morning in the workshop is uh, measurement device independent QKD. And this is um, uh, an idea where Alice and Bob actually both have um, a source of single photons where they encode uh, quantum states. And they actually send them to a, a middle station, which we can call Charles in this case. And uh, here we perform a Bell state measurement. So here, after this Bell state measurement is essentially in, it's entangling the two sources, producing some sort of Bell state, and then if we know that uh, the if if even if this um, box here is malicious, if the measurement is not not done correctly, then actually we will not have any quantum correlation and not create a key, and uh, essentially it's secure because of this. One problem with such a scheme is that um, uh, it is actually not not so performant if you compare it directly with a prepare and measure scheme uh, because we actually have to have these two single photons um, or weak coherent states uh, modulated with a decoy um, scheme and then interacting and interfering at this beam splitter. So it actually means that we have quite low rates because we have to detect two photons and the probability of that um, uh, goes down very quickly. And also it, it's experimentally challenging because both of them have to be perfectly indistinguishable in all degrees of freedom. And of course, there have been very uh, impressive demonstrations um, for measurement device independent QKD. But I would just like to uh, still overview, like how you know how much further do they still need to go to be at the same performance level as uh, prepare and measure QKD systems. So I think um, this experiment uh, here from from this paper uh, managed to do I think the rock record distance of MDI so far of 200 kilometers. So as you can see, at, at this uh, maximum distance, um, the secret key rate was around um, 0 0.02 bits per second. Um, so indeed, to actually carry out an experiment like this, it has to run for 130 hours before they have enough finite key uh, um, size in order to actually distill anything. Um, and indeed, it's a little bit uh, impractical. Whereas if we compare a pair of measure QKD system, at 200 kilometers, from, from the latest uh, results, can achieve around one kilobit. So we're really, you know, in order to bridge the gap between this and this, uh, there really is some room. 
Um, the one thing that we're actually uh, the, the proposing in this uh, scheme is um, a kind of different uh, idea of where instead of using these two photons, which are then going to a Bell state measurement, you actually use just a single photon, but two degrees of freedom. So I'll quickly kind of talk uh, to you through uh, talk you through it. So um, in the first case, Alice is doing exactly the same thing as in MDI. She prepares a um, one of the BB84 state and forwards it to Bob, who actually in the same uh, photon encodes a different degree of freedom. So in this case, we use polarization for Alice and then uh, spatial degree of freedom for Bob, um, which he can encode with his phase modulator, his qubit. And in fact, then this section of the device performs a Bell state measurement between these two degrees of freedom. And what this achieves is that, in fact, um, these detectors here uh, do not reveal, when, when there's a click at this detector, just this result by itself doesn't reveal what the bit uh, sequence is. But it is an entangling measurement between both qubits of Alice and Bob. So in fact, um, although this is not exactly the same as uh, MDI in the sense that we can't simply say that all of this measurement device is now uh, completely untrusted, what we can say is that we really need to make sure that all of the section of the um, apparatus is well characterized and completely trusted, but we can now just uh, uh, be less trusting of our detectors. So this is kind of like a, uh, an in-between of a prepare and measure scheme and an MDI scheme. So it's you know the bridge and the gap between those. So the protocol actually runs very similar to MDI. As I just said before, Alice chooses her state um, sends it to Bob, he encodes his state in the same qubit, uh, in the same photon, and um, then announces when there's a Bell state measurement together with the basis that he actually chose to um, encode it in. And then if this Alice is if Alice chose a compatible basis, so just like a sifting procedure in BB84, um, Bob can actually determine what Alice's bit value is, and we'll see how this correlation can, uh, f from the result. So the proof of principle experiment that, that we did um, uh, looks like this. We, we used um, um, a spontaneous down conversion photon source, um, which is heralded by this single photon detector. Once this clicks, we know that we have a single photon coming out here, and um, we then encoded it with uh, a static encoding scheme. So this is not a real time QKD, this is, as I said, it's a proof of principle. So we sent encode this single photon here, send it to Bob, and then he um, encodes his degree of freedom, and then this is the Bell state measurement. So, in fact, if we look at the results, um, as I said, um, uh, maybe I haven't pre mentioned it previously, now with this scheme where we have two, uh, just a single photon, um, we can actually perform a completely full Bell state measurement, so that means that we really have access to all four Bell states, whereas with MDI, the best that's possible is actually only 50% because of the uh, two photon interference. So um, now as you can see, these are the uh, theoretical predictions with these uh, colored boxes and the experimental results that we got. So for every time that there is one of the detectors click, what these bell states are being announced. And then this is the probabilities of this actually happening given that Alice encoded one of these states and Bob encoded one of these states. So we can see that there is actually um, correlation when they use compatible bases, and this is how Bob can actually decode what Al what Alice encoded in the first place. So um, from this experiment, we can see that we can achieve very good uh, Cuba, um, I uh, ideal for uh, P distribution. However, our scheme inherently is not a real QKD because this is just a, a slow uh, proof of principle experiment, um, and you can, as you can see, the coincidence rates were very low. So what's our wish list uh, in order to make this uh, into a real system? Uh, first of all, we'd probably get rid of this single photon uh, spontaneous conversion, um, down conversion um, source. Uh, then we need to do some real time modulation of the uh, state on Alice's side. And also in on Bob's side, in this proof of principle experiment, we use the simply a, a piezo fiber stretcher to encode this um, state. However, this is very slow. And uh, the real challenge here is that this, uh, th this encoding on the 
phase modulator has to be completely insensitive to the polarization state coming in, and this is very difficult. Um, so on for the first part on Alice's side, we actually um, stick with polarization encoding for now. Um, and this is carried out by sending um, a superposition state onto a phase modulator. And in fact, uh, a lithium niobate phase modulator, when uh, the input state is um, uh, diagonal, then actually we can encode a phase between the H and V components. So this is a, a, a perfect way to do high speed uh, um, uh, modulation with polarization. And in this case, we actually do it at 625 megahertz um, in real time, which is actually, so all the states are chosen with a, an FPGA, we're in a 2.5 gigahertz. And this is actually um, all done using uh, the platform that uh, has already been mentioned in the two talks by Nicola and uh, Nino just before me. Um, and essentially we use this uh, platform to carry out these experiments. So in, in the first case, we actually just did the DB84 tests for with the source, and we can see that even without um, a decoy encoding, which is the kind of the, the best uh, that we can achieve with PKD, we can still go um, over 120 kilometers with such a polarization encoding source. So um, on the actual Bob side, as I mentioned before, it's, it's quite a challenge to uh, do this encoding on the spatial degree of freedom, but doing it in a completely um, polarization insensitive way. So the solution that we actually uh, used is a Sanyak interferometer because this is uh, inherently uh, 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 stable. And um, in fact, we're still using this uh, phase modulator, which only modulates the phase between H and V. But now in this Sanyak uh, configuration, I cannot really go into details of uh, exactly how it works. Uh, we can actually achieve all the encodings that we need. And in a way, just to quickly introduce it, um, it looks something like this. You, this, all these components of the phase modulator and the wave plate, they can carry out a unitary transformation on the either the H uh, component of the state if it comes through like this in this sense, or a V component which goes through in this sense. And in fact, on each side, it um, is able to create the same state, um, which is what we want. So in this case, I'll just give you an example. If we if the state encoded by Alice is H, um, it will come through like this. And if on Bob's side, he chooses these uh, gamma and delta values such that on this part we have V, then we have the photon reflected here. It goes to this PBS, which is actually at 45 degrees. So we have a probability half of either one of these Bell states being projected. Um, however, if we, if Bob actually chose an incompatible basis, then the photon can actually split in, all in both of these paths and um, all the detectors might click with equal probability. So this is where um, we would actually discard the results because we can't get any correlation. So um, overall, we measure, we've so far tested this um, receiver um, in a kind of static way. So we, we still operate in 625 megahertz, but not choosing uh, real-time random sequences. And we get a nice uh, visibility of uh, 90%. Um, and in fact, if we actually added this to our BB84 test, we would expect to have uh, 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 up to around 100 kilometers uh, without any decoy. So this is an ongoing uh, effort at the moment. And indeed, if we actually implemented the decoy um, encoding on Alice's side, with this scheme, we can actually uh, go as far as 250 kilometers um, in distance, which is already would already be uh, longer than uh, has been shown so far with MBI PKD and uh, at considerably higher uh, P rates. So to conclude, I just want to, um, I showed you a, a, an alternative solution to MDI PKD, which is definitely not a replacement because it is, uh, you know, it has a completely different set of assumptions. So in this case, we need to trust the linear optic setup of uh, Bob. However, we can then take out the detectors from the um, secure, um, um, from, from the very highly <coughs> characterized uh, part of the uh, apparatus. 
Um, and this is actually comes at the with the advantage that we get uh, higher throughput in terms of the key rate and uh, simpler uh, implementation since we don't need an interference between two completely indistinguishable photons. Um, so I've showed you the proof of principle demonstration of this idea and then how also our efforts in uh, producing a high speed uh, real time encoding system. So uh, with this I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and particularly my collaborators in Geneva and especially Alberto um, Baron who is has, has been doing a lot of work on this high speed implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, first I, I have a small comment and, and then a question. The first comment is in the second or third slide, you compare the performance of MDQKD with the one, one of the cow protocol, and you saw that the cow protocol gives high key rate. Mm -hmm. One has to be careful because one is a security proof against coherent attacks, that is yeah. MDQKD, and the other one is against collective attack. So I don't think it's a fair comparison. And of course, it also depends on the detection efficiency you put on the detectors that strongly influence the final result. <laughs> so this is the comment, and then the, the question. Um, it's about this kind of detector device in the uh, independent uh, QQD systems. I think they are very nice, and it's a very nice idea. But as far as I know, one of the main problems right now is that one cannot really prove the security. So it's th because uh, this was not mentioned at all in your talk. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear even if they are even secure against blinding attack, for instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I, I completely agree with both comments. So indeed, uh, in terms of the comparison with uh, the prepare and measure scheme and MDI QKD. I agree that it's very difficult, but I simply took two state-of-the-art systems, and in the end, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, of course, they're completely based on different ways um, of uh, doing the proof. However, I think it would still be challenging, even if the, the efficiencies were exactly the same and um, and the rates were exactly the same, I think MDI would still have slightly lower key rate. <coughs> I mean, that was just a way to um, promote this push. Um, and for the security side, I completely agree also. So, so far, um, it has been proved, it can be shown that um, if Eve actually only forwards always a single photon, then it is secure. That's, that, that's true. And indeed, uh, one very interesting theoretical question now is if actually Eve is allowed to send more and more, fo more photons, which would be the case for blinding attack, for example. Um, would it still be secure? And this is definitely an open question. Yeah. Um, the intuition is that it might be because uh, what Bob is essentially, what Bob's apparatus is doing is randomizing the where all these photons are going to go on the output. So this would essentially kind of, if there was a blinding attack happening, all the photons would go to all the detectors, so they would all be blinded. But then when the pulse, which is going to control which detector should click, is also going to be split everywhere. So in principle, it, sh it, it might work, but indeed to prove it would be harder. And, uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to do that so far. Uh, and I leave it to the community to think about it for sure. Yeah. Any other question? All right, and let's thank the speaker again.